Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues and friends of the Kita Hamburger Center, Law is Culture. Let me welcome you today at our forum. Our speaker tonight is Professor Marco Wan from Hong Kong, who will give a talk on the topic Representing Law in Hong Kong Cinema. Hong Kong's legal history during the time of its return from Britain to China is quite unique. The signing of the Sino-British Declaration in 1984 marked the beginning by setting out the conditions under which Hong Kong would revert to Chinese rule. The proscribed one country, two systems principle was subsequently laid down in the basic law as the constitution of Hong Kong, special administration region of the People's Republic of China is called. It contains not only fundamental rules about the relationship with the central government, defining the degree of autonomy, but also fundamental rights and freedoms for Hong Kong residents. The creation of this Bill of Rights uh, following, uh, as well as the period that followed it, uh, was characterized by intense political as well as legal debates. They concerned the nature of the law, uh, the rule of law, the degree of autonomy, and ultimately the identity of Hong Kong's residents. These issues were widely discussed in the public, but it was not only uh, covered the news, uh, but uh, also uh, Hong Kong cinema was really obsessed with legal issues. To focus on uh, film representations of trials and courtroom scenes constitutes a fascinating endeavor. They reflect the legal debates and thus provide insight into how the law was understood at the time. Simultaneously, such films also contribute themselves to social and legal debates, thereby also shaping those debates. With his focus on law and film, Mark I is part and forefront uh, of a fascinating new perspective. Whereas meanwhile, law and literature is a well-established discipline, at least on the international level, the wider field of law and the arts is still only emerging. Under the auspices of my colleague Werner Gebhardt, uh, it was and is in the focus of the center's work. During the last years, we have been enriched by the perspectives of fellows from such diverse disciplines as architecture, film, and music. It is a great pleasure, therefore, to continue this line with a view to Hong Kong cinema and the law. This is especially intriguing since the era of the 1980s can be seen as the birth of a new and modern cinema that was internationally recognized with its vibrant approach and distinctive identity. Before I will give the floor uh, to Marco Wan, it is my pleasure to introduce him. Dr. Marco Wan could not be better qualified for his research project because he has pursued both legal and literary studies which he did at some of the uh, world's leading places of scholarship. He studied at Yale, Cambridge, and Harvard Law School, and back again at Cambridge, where he respectively received both bachelor and master's degrees in comparative and European literature, as well as in law, and subsequent, subsequently obtained his PhD. In 2010, he was visiting scholar both at the University of Cambridge as well as at the University of Oxford, as one would refer to in Cambridge, the other place. Recently, he was also visiting professor of law at the National University of Singapore. Currently, Marco Wan is associate professor of law and honorary associate professor of English at the University of Hong Kong. There, he also serves as associate dean for international affairs. His research areas include law and literature, law and film, legal theory, gender, sexuality, and the law. He has published widely in these areas and authored numerous uh, book chapters as well as articles in internationally renowned peer-reviewed journals. Notably, he has taken over the task as managing editor of law and literature, the world's leading journal in the field. 
He also serves on a number of editorial boards of other specialized journals. Professor Wan received several research grants throughout his career. Moreover, for three times already, he was recipient of the Hong Kong University Research Output Prize and was twice awarded the Outstanding Teaching Award. Since uh, June 2017 now, Marco Wan is fellow at our center and we are very glad to have him here. While at the center here, uh, he is pursuing a project on constitutional debates and Hong Kong cinema. His talk today will allow us a glimpse uh, of what his research is about. I am very much looking forward to hearing you. Mark. Hi, thank you very much, Nina, for that generous introduction um, and for setting out some of the legal context of Hong Kong. Can I cut that bit from the paper, though? Um, so thank you for being here. Um, and this paper is taken from my ongoing book projects, very much a work in progress, um, on law and Hong Kong cinema. Um, so I'm in the book, I'm looking at representations of law in Hong Kong cinema from the early 80s to the present day. Um, and I'm not going to you know, give a long exposition of the constitutional history of Hong Kong. But I think for the purposes of this paper, there are two, maybe three dates that are particularly significant. So as Nina mentioned, 1984, right, which was the, day, the date of the uh, sign of British Joint Declaration. So it was decided, officially announced on that day that Hong Kong would no longer be a British colony uh, after 97, it would be returned to China. Um, 1997, which was the year of the actual handover. Um, and then, to some extent, 2014, um, which was the year of Occupy Central in Hong Kong. Um, so a kind of mass sit-in, um, which was sparked by demands for democratic reform. So. Much of the book um, is examining how film responds to legal debates of its time. Um, and in addition to that, there is also a kind of subsidiary question of questions of identity. Um, and here I'm looking at John because he asked me a question about identity at the last fellows meeting and I uh, didn't respond to it very well. So hopefully in part, of the, part of this paper will, will address that question more, uh, more directly. Um, and you know, questions of Hong Kong, so within Hong Kong film studies, film scholars have long looked at Hong Kong cinema as a way of uh, articulating um, complexities of identity um, in the years leading up to the handover um, and also in the years afterwards. Um, and I think there is a sense in which that focus on questions of identity has led film scholars away from more specific questions about the law. Um, so, you know, the book is mostly about uh, how films respond to legal debates, but they, they, it will also touch on questions of identity. Um, the boundaries of the study, I mean, in a sense, this is an impossible project because one can say that all of Hong Kong cinema is about the law, right? So one thinks of gangster films, policier films, right? There's always a legal element in there. Um, so I have to delineate the boundaries of the project somehow. Um, and the way I've come up with delineating the boundaries of the project um, is by focusing on films with trial scenes. So a trial in the film, however brief, I take as a signal of a more explicit legal thematics. Um, so in this paper, I will talk about two very different films um, so, just as to give people a sense of the range of films that are out there. Um, and so, the first film I'll talk about, uh, the first film I'll talk about is called Lawyer Lawyer. Um, it came out in the pivotal year of 1997. Um, and I'll focus more on kind of the legal uh, debates surrounding that film. Um, and then the second film I want to talk about is a thriller. Um, and it's called Insanity. David Lee's Insanity, and that was in 2015. And that, with that film, I'll talk a little bit more about questions of identity. Um, so my discussion of both of these films um, is based on material that's already published in, in article form, in book chapter form, but I'm reworking a lot of this material for the book. Um, and so I would very much welcome your comments. Um, so the paper will 
proceed in two parts, right, one for each film, and within each part there will be kind of three sections just to kind of map out how I'm going to uh, be speaking this evening. So first of all, I'll try to give a sense of what the film is about. I'm not assuming that people will have seen them. Um, and then after a kind of narrative arc, I'll talk more specifically about the legal and political context of the film. Right? And then in the final part, I'll try to do a close reading of each film to give a sense of how the film is responding to questions about law, questions about identity. Um, so the first film, Lawyer, Lawyer, which came out in 1997. So this is a film that opens in southern China in the in late 19th century, in the late 19th century. Um, and we are introduced to two characters to begin with, um, Fun and Chan. Chan is the lawyer figure. Uh, he is uh, the lawyer figure in ancient China. He is revered in, uh, in, his, in his village. He is very well read, very knowledgeable. And Fun is his servant. Um, so we have a kind of master-servant relationship. And what happens in the film is after a dispute, Fu and the servant leaves Chan and goes to Hong Kong, which at the time, of course, was a British colony. So he goes to Hong Kong. And then once he gets to Hong Kong, things take a very bad turn for him, and he is framed for murder. Right? So he didn't actually commit the murder, but he's accused of murder and put in jail. Um, and when Chan hears that his former servant has been framed for murder in Hong Kong, he rushes to Hong Kong to help him. But of course, you know, he doesn't know the common law, he doesn't know the system, uh, the legal system in Hong Kong, so he, he, uh, he doesn't succeed in court. Um, and Foon is sentenced to execution um, by, uh, sentenced to death by hanging. So I'll show you just a trailer to give you a sense of the film. Oh no. Felix, help. Yes, wait a minute. <laughs> Okay. Um, so in the film, Fun is sentenced to death by hanging. Um, and the scene I want to focus on, I mean, there's obviously quite a lot going on in there. The scene I want to focus on here is the execution scene. Um, so what happens in the film is Fun is sentenced to death by hanging, and you have the execution scene, and Fun is taken up to the execution site, and the rope is put around his neck, and he's about to die. And Chan rushes up to the stage at the last moment um, and rescues Boon. Um, and he does it through an act of interpretation. Um, and his argument goes something like this. He says, the term for death by hanging in Chinese consists of four characters. It's Wan Sao Jing, which literally means a sentence whereby a hoop is placed around one's neck Right, so wan is a hoop, sao is your neck, ji is of, ying is sentence. So a sentence whereby a hoop is placed around one's neck. And his argument is, since the hoop is already around Fun's neck, technically, the sentence has already been carried out in full. Right? There is nothing in the four characters, wan, sao, ji, which stipulates that the hoop has to be tightened or that the person has to die. Um, and so he argues that on the proper construction of the court's ruling, Foon's death did not in fact constitute the necessary outcome of the sentence. The sentence was completed when the hoop was already there. Um, and obviously, you know, this is a, an intensely perverse, literal interpretation of the phrase one, so Di. But the judge cannot deny Chan the force of his logic because the judge himself had insisted that the common law rules of procedure have to be followed in a similarly literal way in the trial. So that's what happens in the execution scene. And I want to argue that this scene can be read specifically as a response to anxieties about the very specific legal issue in Hong Kong at the time, um, which is the use of English legal precedent after the handover. Um, one of the major issues in the years leading up to the handover is what is going to be the place of English precedent, English case law in Hong Kong 
after Hong Kong becomes part of China again. Um, and I want to demonstrate that part of uh, the Chan strategy here stems from an, uh, an invisible, if you like, English case in the execution seat. Um, so that's kind of the, the plot summary. Um, the context, the legal context around questions of English precedent. So again, the film came out in 1997. One of the main legal concerns around 97 was this. In the colonial days, the law of Hong Kong was the common law, so lawyers cited English cases in the local courts. But what would happen to the common law after Hong Kong ceased to be a British colony? How should local lawyers treat English case law? Hong Kong's constitution, the basic law, stipulates that the common law and the rules of equity would remain unchanged after the handover. But it was ambiguous about the exact authority of English cases in the Hong Kong courts and the extent to which they should be regarded as binding. And a glance at the press of the time gives us a sense of the anxieties. In, the, in an article published on the day of the handover, the legal correspondent of the South China Morning Post, which is the main English language newspaper in Hong Kong, notes that, and I quote, when lawyers discuss the future of Hong Kong's criminal law, they sound like environmentalists con concerned with preserving an endangered species, end quote. Right, so there's this anxiety that we have to keep the English common law. We can't let it change. Right. And the criminal law is arguably the area that saw the greatest localization. Right? So there was this desire to preserve the, uh, the English criminal law. Um, a law lecturer notes that in the area of commercial law, there would likely be a strong move towards local precedent, and the courts and advocates will distance themselves from British jurisprudence. However, in the same article, the chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce warned that the business community would be too wary of too much change in the law. He says, the assumption is that the legal system will stay the same. If there is significant tinkering, it could affect business confidence. And there were also debates about how company law should change, right? whether it, would, it should be localized, whether English case law should be kept, whether we should incorporate um, laws from New Zealand, and Canada. Right? So there was all this anxiety about what was going to happen to English law, how was it going to be used. Um, and that was all in the years leading up to 1997. Um, and in this particular scene, um, I think the question of precedent comes in because one could interpret Chan's interpretation in the execution scene as being derived from an earlier English case. This case is a fictional one, which seems appropriate given that we're talking about the film trial. Um, and in the, in, the, in the longer article version of this paper, I set out much more clearly um, how I arrived at this conclusion uh, that there is another case at work here. Um, but just to state my conclusion, I would posit that the case which Chan relies on here is Shylock's case from William Shakespeare's The Merchant of Venice, in which Portia traps Shylock through a perversely literal reading of his bond. And in that case, if you know The Merchant of Venice, uh, Portia, disguised as Balthasar, traps Shylock through a literal reading of the bond. Right? Shylock is entitled to a pound of flesh but first of all, he cannot draw any blood when cutting the pound of flesh, because that's not stipulated in the bond, the blood. And second of all, he must perform the impossible task of cutting exactly one pound of flesh, because the bond does not entitle him to any more or any less than one pound. So her reading of the term a pound of flesh in the bond uses the very law which Shylock relies upon to deny what he seeks. Just as here, Chan, Chan's interpretation of Wan Sao Jian um, uses the very law which the English uh, court relies on and it denies what the English court uh, is, is seeking, which is Putin's life. Um, so again, you know, I won't go too much into the multiple structural parallels between Foon's case and Sherlock's case, but in brief, they are united by the force of their perversely literal readings and the ruthlessness with which both lawyer figures, Chan and Portia, 
pursue the consequences of their interpretations. Um, and if you're so unconvinced by the presence of Shakespeare in Lawyer, Lawyer, I'd like to point out that Shakespeare is explicitly evoked in the penultimate scene of the film. And in that scene, this is a year after the trial, you know, Foon is set free, and he's, he's getting married. He's, married to, he's getting married to the girl of his dreams. And, his, and after the marriage, uh, he tells Chan that the girl is going to go off to study, go off to England to study. And Chan says, well, what's she studying? And Foon says, she's studying English literature. Um, and Chan says, oh, as in Shakespeare. And Foon goes, yeah, you know, you know Shakespeare? And Chan says, yes, the study of Shakespeare is suitable for her. I know Shakespeare. You can ask me anything about Shakespeare. And then the scene fades into Chan expounding on his knowledge of Shakespeare to Foon. And you know, at first sight, the scene seems incongruous with the rest of the film. Right? Why is there a reference to Shakespeare in the final five minutes of the story? Right, when the playwright had not been mentioned at all in the film. Um, but I would suggest that the scene no longer seems in Congress if we read it in the context of the trial. Right? As a man known for his intelligence and his knowledge, and the film makes this very clear, Chan is very well read. Right? We're explicitly told he knows his Shakespeare. And he is likely to have known about The Merchant of Venice, right? specifically that it contains the most famous trial scene in the entire Shakespearean corpus. So one way of thinking about that, that penultimate scene is as the revelation of the inspiration of Chan's interpretative strategy. So what I've been proposing so far is that Shylock's case informs and directs Chan's argument in Foon's trial. To put the idea slightly differently, I'm positing that Shylock's case functions as an English precedent on which Chan relies to build his argument in the scene of interpretation and what could be more English and have more authority as precedent than a fictional case penned by the bard himself. The legal theorist Neil Duxbury has argued that the doctrine of precedent is not as conventionally understood, premised on the idea that cases bind, but on the more nuanced requirement that in the common law courtroom, quote, past events be respected as guides for present action, end quote. And I think it is precisely in this capacity that Chan draws upon Shylock's case in Lawyer, Lawyer. And one can also say that by citing Shylock's case in this way, Chan is being true to Shakespeare's text because Portia herself is aware of the value of the play's trial scene as judicial precedent. She notes that the correct judgment must be rendered in Shylock's case in the play because, quote, it will be recorded for a precedent and if wrongly decided, many an error by the same example will rush into the state, end quote. So I'm going to probe a little bit more deeply into this idea of precedent as present in the trial scene, in the execution scene. How might we read Chan's use of the English precedent in the form of Shylock's case as a filmic response to the question about English precedent in the post-colonial era in Hong Kong? Chan does not reject English law, but works within its framework by citing an English case. The film therefore seems to be suggesting that we should not favor an outright abandonment of English cases after the handover. So around those years, you know, there were calls to just get rid of English case law, replace them, localize them. Um, and one way of thinking about the, the scene here is, you know, the, the film is suggesting that there is something of value, right, in the English cases that come people. We shouldn't just throw them out the window. After all, English case law had served Hong Kong well for many years. On the other hand, Chan is obviously citing the case in his own idiosyncratic way. Instead of giving the full tie citation and the facts of the case, he introduces it subtly um, into the trial with the advantage that it becomes difficult for his opponent to identify the source of his argument. Moreover, unlike Portia who sides with the law, Chan cites an English case in order to challenge the colonial justice system. 
He traps the judge into freeing Fun because he realizes the judge cannot deviate from the literal interpretation that he himself had argued for during the trial. So in a sense, the use of Shylock's case by Chan is nothing less than the post-colonial strategy of resistance. The film seems to suggest that Hong Kong lawyers should not adopt a differential or uncritical attitude towards English precedent. While English cases should continue to have a place in Hong Kong's legal system after 1997, they should not be given the same level of authority and deference um, that they once had. So Chan's mode of introducing Shylock's case into his interpretative argument points to the third possible way of using English precedent after 97. Not outright rejection, not wholesale adoption, but taking the English cases and using them in a way which would serve Hong Kong's circumstances as it confronted new legal scenarios after the handover. And I think one indica further indication of that is the way in which Chan evokes Shakespeare's name in Chinese uh, in that penultimate scene. So again, in that scene, Fun is telling Chan that his wife is going to go study English literature, and they talk about Shakespeare, and the whole conversation is in Cantonese. Um, the Cantonese phrase for Shakespeare is Sa Si Bei A, uh, which is onomatopoeia, right? So Shakespeare, Sa Si Bei A, Sa Si Bei A. Um, and during the conversation, Chan facetiously um, changes one of the characters. So instead of, instead of saying Sa Si Bei A when referring to Shakespeare, he says Sa Si Bei La, and he changes the final character A to La. And what that does is um, it, it changes the, um, the tonal effect, right? So, Bei A, Bei A doesn't have a meaning, it just means Shakespeare. Bei La actually has a meaning in Cantonese, and it refers to a body part, specifically that body part between the genitals and the leg, right? So not a particularly, that, this bit here, right? So not a particularly appealing body part. And the effect of, so it's a pun, right? And the effect of this pun, this transformation of Sasi Beya to Sasi Beila, the effect is to transform the greatest playwright in English literary history into a random body part, um, and not a particularly elegant part either. Chan's ap appellation of Shakespeare, his transformation of his name, can be interpreted as an indication of how he conceives of Shakespeare. Right? Not as an authority or great figure to be revered or deferred to, Shakespeare, the bar, but as an entity that can be linguistically transformed, remolded, reconceptualized in a Chinese context. Through translation into a different linguistic and cultural frame, the term Shakespeare can become a pun and become funny in ways that Shakespeare himself would not have understood. This treatment of Shakespeare's name, by extension, can give us an indication of the way Chan is prepared to read and cite Shylock's case, not with great deference or reverence, as if it was an absolute authority that must be strictly followed, but with creativity, lateral thinking, a sense of humor, playfulness, even a certain degree of disdain. So he's capable of using his plays and his name creatively to suit the new cultural and legal context in which he finds himself. So just as Chan draws on Shakespeare but evokes his name in a way which is irreverent and even daring by playing with his name, and just as Chan cites Shylock's case in a way which departs from the traditional revered mode of citing cases in court, so Hong Kong lawyers, the film seems to suggest, should continue citing English precedent, but be bold enough to do so in new, creative, and even unorthodox, unorthodox ways to enable the legal system in Hong Kong to face the challenges ahead. Terry Eagleton writes that legal case history is not just a record of past applications of the law, but a tradition of continuous interpretation of it which bears enforceably on any current act of legal judgment. And the ability to draw on English precedent in new and creative ways 
is part of this process of continuous interpretation, which is especially necessary at the time of sovereignty change. The film suggests that instead of rejecting or deferring to the colonial past, Hong Kong lawyers should take what we have inherited from English law, but always be ready to change it, to adapt it to local context, to local language, to the local culture in the post-colonial period. As Sir Yang Tiliang, the first Chinese person to serve as Hong Kong's Chief Justice, once noted, the common law in Hong Kong must adapt and evolve. And he says, and I quote, there must be transformation, a process by which the spirit of the legal system is so mingled with the culture and ethos of the new society that the new system emerges, still largely based on the ancestry whence it came, but evidencing a metamorphosis which has eradicated its foreignness." End quote. Through Chan's use of Shylock's case as precedent, Lawyer Lawyer, I think, gives us a filmic depiction of how such a transformation can take place and suggests that in the post-handover period, Hong Kong lawyers should continue to make use of English case law, but they must not be afraid to allow them to be reworked, recontextualized, reinterpreted, so that they can evolve together with the city as it moves towards past Hong 1997. Uh, so that's the first film. Right, um, and that came out in 1997. Um, so there is, there's still this kind of obsession with Englishness, the colonial past, how to deal with the colonial past. You know, the, the, you know, the colonial courtroom, you see, the judge with the wigs. Um, that's a Caucasian judge um, uh, sitting on the bench. Uh, although that's um, Paul Fonorov, who's also a film critic. He speaks fluent Cantonese. Um, so he's speaking Chinese in the, in the film. And the second film I want to talk about, a very different kind of film from a much more uh, recent time, so 2015, David Lee's Insanity. So this is a thriller, right? a tale of murder, mystery, delusion, which was nominated for four categories at the Hong Kong Film Awards, and Lee received the award for Best Director on the Strength of this film. And it also revolves around two characters, uh, but much more so here. I, mean, I was highlighting the two characters before, but this one is really centered on two people. So the two people are Fan and Chow. Fan is the criminal. At the beginning of the film, we see Fan pushing his wife out the window um, following a dispute, um, and then he is brought to court. Um, and what happens is uh, he's brought to trial for murder and in light of a medical report confirming Fan's schizophrenia, um, the, he is convicted of the lesser offense of involuntary manslaughter um, and sentenced to an indefinite period of observation in a psychiatric hospital. Um, and Chow, the other character, is Fan's psychiatrist. He's Fan's doctor in the hospital. Um, so, Fan commits, you know, this killing. He's diagnosed as schizophrenic, put in the hospital or a psychiatric ward, where he's looked after by Chow, his doctor. And then uh, a turning point happens three years later, uh, when Chow, the doctor, deems that Fan has now fully recovered from his schizophrenia and is free to go. Right. So he makes a medical judgment that he's free to go. Lets him go. And as pretty much as soon as he lets him go, Fan is involved in another murder, this time of a drug addict. And Chow, the doctor, is terrified because he was the one who made the professional judgment that he was fine. And as soon as he leaves, he commits another murder. Um, and so um, he's afraid, Chow, the doctor, is afraid of what this would do to his professional reputation. So what Chow does is he goes out, finds Fan, and brings him into his own office and locks Fan to his office and basically tries to cure him again. All right, so he wouldn't let him leave his office until, until Fan is fully cured. Does that, does that make sense? Right. Um, so that's kind of the premise of the film. Uh, but there are two choices uh, to in the final third of the film where they're in that office together. Uh, the first twist is that Chow, the doctor, we're told, is also schizophrenic. Um, and in fact, Fan had completely recovered, but 
because of his stress, because of, of what had happened, um, Chow gets very stressed, and the stress triggers his own schizophrenia, right? And in that in that um, extended sequence in the in the office, the doctor patient relationship changes. So it's now Fan, who has fully recovered, who plays the kind of doctor figure, and Chow, the doctor. Um, is now the patient. He's the one whose episode of schizophrenia has been triggered. Right. So I'll play the trailer for that one as well. As well. Okay. So the first twist is that Chow, the doctor, is also schizophrenic. The second twist is that in that extended sequence in the office, Fan isn't actually there. Um, Fan in that sequence is a figment of Chow's imagination, right? So Chow is schizophrenic. He can't deal with the fact that he's schizophrenic. And so what he does, so when he locks himself in the office, he's trying to cure himself. It's only him, there's nobody else in the office. He's trying to cure himself, but he can't deal with the fact that he's trying to cure himself. So he conjures up the imaginary Fan and tells himself that he's curing somebody else so that he doesn't have to confront the fact that he's schizophrenic. Does that make sense? Right. Um, so there's quite a lot going on, and you know, one thing I'm hoping to do with this film, as I think through uh, this notion of that split, um, is placing the film within a whole tradition of splits in Hong Kong cinema. Right, so you know, if we think of um, a film like Face Off with John Travolta, which is by a Hong Kong director, right? I mean, that is very much about split identities, right? Um, and if we think of a film like Infernal Affairs, which came out in 2000, early 2000s, right? That's a film about a police, a police mall and a triad mall, right? So a police who has been placed within a crime gang as a mall, and then someone in the crime gang who has been placed within the police as a mall. Um, and, you know, there is all this kind of doubleness going on, which is a real tradition in Hong Kong cinema, which culminates, I think, in uh, insanity, right, where the other person that he thinks he's treating is actually himself, right, and is pathological, right, and, and that split has become an illness in modern Hong Kong society, and there's something very weird going on, very interesting going on, which has to do with Hong Kong identity, so I'll, I'll expand on that. So again, the discussion of the film is divided into two parts. In the first part, I'll give the kind of historical context and set up the intellectual framework. In the second part, I'll give a closer reading of the film. So context and intellectual framework. So writing ahead of local elections in 2012, a British journalist astutely noted that Hong Kong was suffering from an identity crisis and attributed the problem to a clash of cultures between Hong Kongers on the one hand and the increasing number of mainland Chinese tourists and residents in the city since the handover in 1997. Um, and there's, there's quite a lot of tension at the moment between people from Hong Kong um, and mainlanders, people from China who come to Hong Kong um, because of the numbers, because of cultural differences, because of linguistic differences. Right? So this has emerged as a point of tension. This journalist observed that from disputes over everyday practices um, such as spitting and knowing how to cue to deeper division over ideas of freedom and the rule of law, Hong Kongers felt torn between accustomed habits and values formed in the colonial era and new realities emerging under Chinese sovereignty. As the city moved further away from the days of colonial rule, she noted that there developed an increasing anxiety that the city would lose its cultural uniqueness. And Occupy Central added a further dimension of division within Hong Kong society as pro and anti-Occupy protesters clashed publicly on the streets. Hong Kong society at the time of insanity's appearance can be said to be characterized by deep-seated disagreements about the nature of Hong Kong identity. Should Hong Kongers attempt to integrate themselves more deeply with mainland China by purging from their minds any remaining colonial influence? Or should they adopt a dual position whereby they recognize their national heritage but also take steps to maintain the colonial past in the present? Furthermore, 
should they insist on the continuation of the democratization process that began under the former administration? Or should they resign themselves to the fact that democracy would necessarily be elusive under Chinese rule? And I think it's possible to recast this crisis of identity in temporal terms as what Frederick Jameson has called a crisis of historicity. On the one hand, Hong Kong identity can be said to be underpinned by the continuation of the colonial past in the present, in the sense that the values, ideas, and habits formed under the former British governance are imagined to continue to structure Hong Kong identity today. As the cultural critic Howard Choi points out, for Hong Kongers, quote, the issue of becoming Chinese again after the end of colonization cannot be discussed without reference to its Britishness, end quote. On the other hand, more recent restrictions on the city's freedoms imposed by the local government have generated great anxiety that basic human rights protections would be lost in the not too distant future, when or even before the basic law expires in 2047. So the basic law is supposed to be in place uh, for 50 years as it's supposed to lapse in 2047. So this fear means that the future very much shapes Hong Kong's identity in the present, in the sense that many Hong Kongers define themselves in the constant presence of an uncertain and potentially nightmarish future. Hong Kong cultural identity can be said to be characterized by the coexistence of the past and the future in the continuing present. As such, the current crisis of identity in Hong Kong can be regarded as a moment of disruption in the narratives of identity formation through the enmeshment of different temporal units onto a single plane. And all of this, of course, is derived from uh, Jameson's discussion of cultural schizophrenia. As Jameson, drawing on the work of Jacques Lacan, argues that the psyche of the schizophrenic can be understood in two interrelated, through two interrelated ideas. First, personal identity is itself the effect of a certain temporal unification of past and present, of past and future with one's present. And second, such active temporal unification is itself a function of language and manifests itself as a disruption in the development of identity narratives by conflicting voices. Jameson concludes by identifying cultural schizophrenia as a condition of late capitalism and postmodernity. In her book on Hong Kong cinema, Vivian Lee brings Jameson's analysis to bear on Hong Kong by pointing out that schizophrenia is not only, quote, symptomatic of being in postmodernity, but also constitutes a pathological condition in postcoloniality, end quote. In the similar vein as Lee, Choi underscores the Hong Kong sense of self as a schizophrenic one. And Lee and Choi's film criticism, in part inspired by Jameson's analysis, testifies to the salience of cultural schizophrenia for contemporary Hong Kong. Um, so you know, the, the historical context I'm trying to set up is that there is a sense of a uh, a schizophrenic self right, in Hong Kong society at the moment, um, as evidenced by cultural and film scholars like Lee, like Choi. So the second part, the close reading or the closer reading of the film. Perhaps the most significant aspect of the film's representation of schizophrenia is its presentation of the condition as a form of internal psychical conflict. The confrontation between Chow and Fan between doctor and patient, between sanity and insanity, is in fact a confrontation of a single character with himself. The internal conflict between Chow and the imaginary fan can be read as the dramatization not only of a society increasingly at odds with itself, but of a cultural identity that is split. And this conflict becomes progressively more hostile as the film narrative develops, right? So the, the, the relationship between doctor and patient becomes intrinsically tense, and that's evidenced through um, the dialogue. Um, and there's this whole dynamic of gazing and reverse gazing as well. So uh, in the office, uh, at one point, Chow, the doctor, is observing Fan, the patient, through his computer screen, right? He's monitoring his every move, diagnosing everything. And then at one point, Chow falls asleep at his computer. 
And as soon as he falls asleep, we see through the computer screen, a computer screen that Fan, who, who we thought had been asleep, suddenly opens his eyes right, and looks straight back. Um, and, and so, you know, he'd only been pretending to be asleep, and he'd been aware of what was going on, and as soon as Chow's asleep, he, he looks back, he gazes back. Right, so there's this whole dynamic of, of looking, looking back, gazing, gazing back. Um, and towards the end, when Chow says to Fan, you should, you should take your medication, why are you not taking the med your medication? Fan stares at him and retorts, maybe you should be the one taking the medication. And I think the significance of this internal conflict for the analysis of Hong Kong cultural identity comes into sharper focus when we consider the casting of the two characters. So just to go back to... Oh, sorry. Okay, there we go. So that's the doc that's the doctor, that's the patient. I don't know how you can see it. Um, so uh, when we consider the casting, Fan, the patient, is played by an actor called Sean Lau who is known to most Hong Kongers through his work in television and film prior to the retrocession. So he came to fame before 1997. Um, he rose to prominence when he was cast as the male lead alongside Edmund Chang in the 1992 series, Greed of Man. And then he's also known for his role in a 1993 film called C'est la vie mon chéri, uh, in which he plays a struggling jazz musician who falls in love with a street opera singer who later dies of cancer. And that film is particularly notable because it's an update of a classic story that everyone knows uh, from 1961 called Love Without End. And even though Sean Lau continued acting in the, uh, throughout the post-colonial period, he, I mean, as you can tell from his age, I mean, he represents an older generation of actors who came to fame in the time of coloniality. Um, and he... And he, and he trained as a very typical actor from that period. So he trained um, in the actor's training program in the um, uh, Television Broadcasting Bureau's actor's training program. Um, and that was a program that produced a lot of famous Hong Kong actors from that period. Um, and he also became famous at a very critical moment. He became famous around 1992 and 1993. So his big films were in 92, 93, which was the absolute peak of the Hong Kong film industry. And after 1992, the Hong Kong film industry declined to a great extent because of competition from mainland China. Um, so Lau, one could say, is an unequivocally Hong Kong actor. And his stardom can be said to connote a bygone era prior to the retrocession, prior to the handover, that is associated with a more vibrant local Hong Kong cinematic production, a greater possibility of fame for local actors, as well as the relative economic prosperity in the city that existed before the shock of the Asian financial crisis in 1998. Chow, on the other hand, the doctor, is played by the heart throb Huang Xiaoming, uh, who, in contrast to Lao, represents a new generation of mainland Chinese actors who came to prominence in Hong Kong in an era of Hong Kong-China co-productions and the increasing dissemination of mainland Chinese films on the local cinematic circuit. In contrast to Huang, who was locally, oh, in contrast to Lao, who was locally trained, Huang was trained at the Beijing Film Academy and first became known through mainland historical dramas. His collab collaborations with Hong Kong directors include Sniper in 2007, American Dreams in China 2013, um, and you know, he became famous because he won them a whole bunch of awards. Um, and unlike Lao, Huang is an unequivocally mainland Chinese actor. And Huang's stardom connotes a different time, not only in Hong Kong's film history, but in its political development a time defined by the increasing presence of the mainland in political, economic, and cultural terms. So in this light, the internal conflict between Fan and Chow that takes place in the office in Insanity 
can be read as the representation of a conflict between two sets of affiliation or two senses of belonging in Hong Kong. On the one hand, an effective attachment to the time, values, habits of an older era as represented by uh, Lao or Fan. And on the other hand, an allegiance to the new post-colonial order as represented by the younger mainland actor Huang or his character Chow. The persona of the actors in Insanity are significant beyond the roles they play in that they evoke the different moments in Hong Kong's film history from which they emerged. The dis disparate conceptions of selfhood formed at different stages in the city's political development and the effective affinities associated with these moments or stages. The confrontation in the doctor's office can be approached as the meeting of the past with the present and the future. And the personal narrative here maps onto the broader cultural narratives of identity of which the film text forms a part. Um, and in the article version, I go into a slightly longer analysis in a kind of Lacanian frame. So I read the, um, the sequence in the office through Lacan's notion of the mirror stage. But um, I know not everyone's psychoanalytically inclined, so I won't impose that on you. We have not, nothing against it. <laughs> no, I know. Uh, but I mean, it's that notion of, of the mirror stage, right? Where there is this um, illusionary certitude, right? The baby looking in the mirror and seeing the reflection and thinking that reflection is himself, right? And Lacan compares that baby to a monkey, right? Because that, that, that isn't the baby. That isn't the self. But it's, it's all an illusion. It's a false security. Just as there is this false sense of security here, which in fact has to be shattered. So what happens at the end? How does the film resolve this internal conflict, bring together the split notions of self, and harmonize these dissenting voices? And it's presaging the ending of the film. Um, the final scene opens with Chow in the psychiatric hospital, this time as the patient. Um, and so, you know, the, the Chow is found in his office by his, by his girlfriend, you know, he's taken to this hospital, um, and, you know, he's reconciled with uh, Fan, the former patient. Um, and the scene hints that, just as Fan was completely cured despite Chow's own insecurities, Chow will also recover from his condition. Chow's girlfriend is sitting next to him, and gently encourages him. She's now heavily pregnant with this child. In the film, we're told that child didn't, child didn't want to have a child because he was afraid of passing on his schizophrenia. But she does get pregnant, um, and he, you know, he's, he's fine with it. And as the film closes, we see Chow's girlfriend holding the newborn baby in her hands, um, and the audience knows that the next generation will grow up um, after the end of this, of this, of this storm. Uh, that we're told is, is happening. Um, so the film seems to suggest that the condition in which Hong Kong finds itself, the temporal disorientation, the societal conflicts, um, the cultural schizophrenia, that will all pass, and the new generation of Hong Kongers will grow up in a city which would have healed itself from the fractures, the dissensions, and the confrontations of today. But this happy ending is more complex than it seems, and this is where I'll end. Um, it's worth noting Fan's fate at the end of the film. So Fan is completely cured. Um, Chow is put in hospital. But the final scene is Fan being put in prison. Um, and the final scene is the shot of him looking out from a prison window, and there is a flower by the prison window that, gl that grows. And, the f and there are multiple ways of reading this image. But the one way of thinking about it is that the film is suggesting that for the new generation to move forward, for that flower by the prison window to grow, the fan character, or the Sean Lau character, representing this colonial past and this effective um, dimension of the past, has to be locked up. Right? And, there has to, and the final scene is him behind bars. Only when that is locked up will the new generation, Huang's baby, Chao's baby, We'll, we'll, only when that happens can the baby grow up in a happy world. Um, and I think, you know, most people see the film as having a happy ending. I think it actually ends quite ominously. Um, and that's where I will stop.